Hello, America. Hello, friends. Hello, everybody. Welcome to your Leo Nation, where we believe in the rule of law, a civil society, and self-responsibility. I am your host, the Chief Mark Garrett. I am so excited to have uh, another stellar guest tonight, and I mean that uh, this woman we're going to talk to has shown real leadership, real courage, and I am a great admirer of hers. Uh, Anne Marie Schuster is the sitting Schubert. DA. Schubert. Schubert. I said Schuster. Look at that. What That's a knucklehead right. I am. I need, <laughs> I need better glasses. And Schubert, uh, the sitting DA, a DA of uh, Sacramento County. I also consider that the, uh, the belly of the beast of California politics. Anne Marie, thank you so much. Welcome aboard. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it very much. Well, you'd appreciate it more if I could say your last name correctly, but uh, okay. that's just me. It's all right. And I'm looking at it right here. Yeah. You know, I was just looking at the uh, the um, the DA's website, your office's website, and and reading about you. It's just an amazing career. 30 year, 31 years prosecutor, uh, spending that time there in Sacramento. And again, we're going to talk about some of the challenges of being DA in that particular county of, right. of all the other 57 uh, in the state. And I was really intrigued by by uh, some of your history here, your involvement, really kind of leadership also in DNA evidence and cold case prosecution. It's really kind of groundbreaking what you've done, a leader in that and training people around the country uh, in cold case DNA files. And I'm certainly going to give an opportunity to talk about that and a lot more. So with that, if you want to give us a little background yourself and uh, give you a couple of minutes and take it away. Sure. Well, first, again, thanks for having me. Um, you know, I, I probably need to update the website because I'm almost, I have over 32 years now. I, I you know, I, ta I tell this to folks and I mean it. I kind of went to law school for the wrong reasons. I really just wanted a decent job when I was done. I never really thought about this profession of being a, quote, prosecutor. I just wanted to get out of school and, you know, have a decent living. And then halfway through law school, I interned for the San Francisco DA's office and a judge in San Francisco. And I absolutely fell in love with this concept of public safety. And I honestly never looked back. Uh, I started my career in 1990 as a young prosecutor in the Bay Area uh, outside of San Francisco in a county called Contra Costa. Worked there a couple of years and I went um, to Solano County. And that was where I, I fell in love with DNA. Had my very first DNA case there, realized it was the greatest tool ever to find the truth. I'm, ironically, that, that case that I had there was during the same time as the O.J. Simpson case. So that was when the world started to understand what this DNA thing was. Um, and so I, I spent, I think, about five years in Solano as a prosecutor, kind of got my feet uh, steadied with doing DNA stuff. Then I came back. I grew up in Sacramento, so I wanted to come home eventually. And so I came back to Sacramento in 1996. And, you know, before I got elected in 20, when I got sworn in, in 2015, I spent the majority of my career, like many folks in you know, most prosecutors' office doing violent crimes, murders, rapes, child abuse. And I really found my niche in cold cases and kind of talked my office into doing a cold case unit back in the early 2000s. You know, the Golden State Killer is probably the most famous case right now. That's people understand that was a very notorious case, not just a serial killing case, but uh, he raped a lot of people in Sacramento. And that was very near and dear to me because I grew up in Sacramento. I grew up near the areas where he was attacking people. So I had this, you know, both professional and personal commitment to that particular case. And I was involved in it for over 20 years. So I, I can't talk enough about that. That's probably another day for another podcast because I could spend a lot of time talking about that, Mark. Um, well, I'll tell you right now, I'll I, continue with your background, but that would be a, a fantastic uh, show just on that. Topic. Sure. It's, it's amazing yeah. law enforcement work done on that case. Very <clears throat> innovative stuff. Um, I was, you know, I was elected, uh, you know, I was very lucky because my boss at the time, who was an exceptional DA, her name was Jan Scully. Uh, she was the DA for 20 years in Sacramento. And then when she decided to retire, I was very fortunate that she asked me if I wanted to run and I'd never really thought about it. And I'm like, yeah, let's go. And so I did. And, um, you know, I've been through the election process now a couple of times. I understand the dynamics. I'm not a politician. I can't stand that part of the job because as you know like law enforcement we're nonpartisan it doesn't matter what your party is doesn't matter 
you know, what your personal beliefs are. We just apply the law no matter where it leads us along with the facts. Um, but I definitely came to understand that the job does involve politics. And, and as you mentioned, Sacramento is kind of the, as you call it, the belly of the beast. <laughs> may be true. Um, we are the hub of, of politics in California. I try to constantly try to tell people, don't blame my office just because it happened in Sacramento. So um, I've been the DA now. I'm coming up on finishing out my second term and I'm going to be, you know, retiring at the end of this term and then moving on to, you know, continue to do public safety, but other stuff outside the job of the DA. So excited to be well, here. Well, I, I am curious. Uh, sorry, I am curious about the, what you're going to do. After we'll talk about that, I think you're sure. in the podcast and, and uh, you know, kind of check in on uh, what the right. uh, rise and holds for you. Um, yeah, but the, the those other cases that you were talking about, um, uh, Golden State Killer, I mean, these are right. fantastic things. There's so much of that that you have been involved with. And I said, we, we're not going to cover it all in one show, so I'm definitely going right. to bring you back. But what a fascinating topic that is. It's amazing. You know what? Uh, I, I, I'm sure it is. And, you know, my 30 years in law enforcement, um, you know, never had the opportunity, for lack of a better word, to be involved in something, you know, quite like that. And I, I asked anybody else listening, you know, would find that fascinating. Talking about your office, the DA's office there in Sacramento County, I'm familiar with, you know, one uh, in the southern part of the state, Los Angeles County. Um, right. but tell us about your office, kind of the structure, maybe the size, sure. the number of personnel, some of the challenges, maybe a little bit of the, how, how things work there. So we're very similar to Los Angeles. We're just not as big. I mean, LA County, I have many good friends from that office. Jackie Lacey was a dear friend of mine. You know, Joey Esposito, who was Jackie's number two, is I consider not only just a good friend, but an amazing human being. Um, Agreed. But it, and he is, he's just brilliant. And so our office is very similar. We're just smaller. Our population is at about 1.6 or so million, maybe a million and a half um, countywide. Uh, we obviously have a number of cities within the, our jurisdiction. So we service, you know, the entire county. We have a, right now probably about 170 prosecutors. Um, we have our own investigators, probably about 40 of them. We have a crime lab. That is one thing that's unique that most DA's offices in the state do not run their own crime lab. It is an enormous benefit. Um, for instance, you know, when the Golden State Killer, when they followed that guy around and got his DNA, that's the kind of stuff then, you know, it goes to the lab and you get to, you get to expedite things and, and prioritize cases based upon need. So it's a huge benefit to have our own crime lab. Amazing people that work there. We have, like many other DA's offices, we have a victim witness assistance program. So a uh, number of social workers that help victims and witnesses and their families through some of the most difficult times of their lives uh, and the court process and obviously support staff. So we, you know, we handle any case that comes in as a misdemeanor or felony. Um, unlike LA, we handle all misdemeanor prosecutions that are state code violations. So um, anything from, you know, petty thefts, drunk drivings, to all the way up to murders and, and everything in between. So we, we have the similar problems that any other large urban metropolitan county has, but perhaps, you know, the lower, lower numbers than someplace like Los Angeles County. No, I appreciate that. It, uh, it does make sense. I kind of get probably lose perspective being from a county with, you know, 13 plus million people. Right. And uh, most are not like that in California. Um, but one thing you do have that Cal that uh, Los Angeles County doesn't have so much of, I've got plenty of it, but not as much as you do, um, is the political, I think, uh, environment that, you know, I kind of joked about early, right. earlier with the belly of the beast. I mean, the state capitol and all the, you know, all the heads of the agencies and state elected officials working there, things like that. I mean, there, there has to be some level of um, pressure, uh, influence legal or yeah. otherwise i would imagine that um those dynamics are are present any place else in california can, can you talk about that sure so well when i became the da of sacramento i again i was sworn in 2015 and as you know mark the, the criminal justice system has been evolving and changing um in my view in many ways not in a good way 
Um, we've constantly seen a, as I call it, the super highway of legislation of bills after bills after bills that are essentially, you know, some may say dismantling the system, um, but definitely, definitely changing the rules, changing the goalposts from what it was back and perhaps in the 90s and even in the 2000s. So as the DA of Sacramento, you know, I understood that because we're kind of the, we're the county seat for the capital, and a lot of other prosecutors and law enforcement kind of look to us as being, you know, the center of that storm. And so we have, we have a legislation unit like, you know, like LADA's office has had one for years, mm -hmm. other large agencies have one. But we're oftentimes not only taking positions on bills, advocating for bills, opposing bills, but we also on many occasions find ourselves over testifying in a legislature either for or against a bill. I will be honest, it's become much, much more difficult over the last number of years. I think there's a complete disrespect for law enforcement and prosecutors at the Capitol. Um, we're not heard from very often. So oftentimes we ask that crime victims speak because they are the voices of those human tragedies. And so I've had them, you know, I remember a few years ago, a bill that wanted to get rid of life without the possibility of parole, basically, or the death penalty. And to have, you know, the wife of someone that's executed in front of her or the wife of a police officer killed, um, have, you're given basically two minutes to tell your, your views on a critical piece of legislation. It's, it's very disheartening because so much is being done in one building with very little uh, input, particularly very little knowledge to the public. And so we're getting legislation that's, I mean, just a couple of weeks ago was the end of the legislative cycle. And this major bill, the bail bill, where they're trying yet again to get rid of uh, the bail system despite the voters uh, wanting it, that was voted on at probably at 10 minutes to midnight. That's, that's how you know, they had to finish their session. So it, it gets a little bit disheartening because there's, you know, we do our regular jobs, which is becoming more and more, um, uh, you know, we have more and more responsibilities, not just prosecuting people. But, you know, my view has always been and always will be, our jobs are not just about prosecution. Yes, we're always going to do that. But we also have a responsibility to be out in our communities to try to prevent crime, to get people back on track, to interfere, in, not interfere, intervene in lives of people that need help could be something that's community outreach could be working with kids could be education programs so that's that's become a big part of our office and then thirdly in the last you know several years we have so much of what we call post conviction work meaning that you know the guys long since been convicted and been sent off to prison and now the rules have changed so now we have to do resentencings or what we call habeas petitions so the volume of work has grown exponentially and it's not in line with the volume of resources. So we expect more and more from our investigators, our prosecutors, our advocates, our crime lab, everybody that's involved in this, but we don't get really extra resources to do it. That's hard. See, this is, yeah, well, well this is interesting. And again, it's, it's, a, it's a topic for another show because it's right. so broad and so deep. You made the point about this. I believe it was the um, maybe it was the, the um, doing away with life without parole, or was the bail? But the, the ten minutes to midnight vote. That um, was the bail. That was the bail the vote was. by. But, yeah, that was actually being carried yeah. by Senator Hertzberg down there. Yeah. Um, See, essentially eliminating it, bail. Right, it's eliminating bail, and this is, of course, we have this. I call it a cancer going on across the country. I mean, Illinois is yeah. going off. I mean, the deep end. I mean, they're all going That's off the hard. deep end. Um, yeah. We're, you know, come come January 23, basically, no one's going to be, no one's bound over. Uh, it's, it's nuts, even for second degree murder. But the idea or the reality that these legislatures, the legislators are voting at midnight have to tell something that, they they don't want this to be known. They don't want to publicize. They don't want transparency when they're doing things like this, the last minute or under the cover of night. Um, and I, I I can't wrap my head around it. Uh, 
exactly why people want to create chaos and, and do away with the rule of law, do away with the civil society. That's what we're looking at right now. These so-called you know, lawmakers, they're law destroyers is what they are, in my, my humble opinion. Well, it's definitely the dismantling of the system in many, many ways. I mean, you know, gun enhancements, <clears throat> gang enhancements, every kind of, you know, we used to have, a, you know, a five-year priors. If you went to prison, then you could get extra time. If you've got prison priors, you can get extra time. And it's really based upon the concept that the if you continue to fail to obey the laws, the consequence it's just like parenting. The consequences could and should go up. Well, those are all kind of being whittled away. And and again, don't get me wrong, I believe in rehabilitation, hundred um, percent. Mm-hmm. But what we're seeing now in California, listen, since COVID started in in California, March of twenty twenty, I think twenty seven thousand inmates have been released from state prison in California alone. Twenty seven thousand. And when, you know, you, you will hear from people that have worked for the prison system that say, listen, if you're going to continue to grant early releases, you know, from prison, but not provide them rehabilitation, we're failing everybody. We're failing that inmate. We're failing society because we're not rehabilitating. We're, we're giving them credits to get out early, really, for sitting there in their cells doing nothing wrong. That's not rehab. That's that's just trying to justify the, the the end that you're trying to get to which is you know reduce the prison population so it does get disheartening but you know we all know on this on the side of law enforcement that every day there's victims out there and it's our responsibility to do everything we can to protect them and to protect the rest of society well i know you're doing that i know it's an uphill battle uh especially out here on the west coast and uh yeah. i applaud you for it and of course we're going to talk about a very high profile um situation you were in, involved in and and i really can't wait for you to uh go into detail about that you know for our listeners sure so and i'll just jump right into it um i was still on the job this is four years ago 2018 it was a case of uh stefan clark um in sacramento and again, I won't take too much thunder away from you, but this sure. this involves a lot of aspects. We have officer law shooting. We have your investigation of a homicide. We have your review of the case, the facts, right. your decision, what to do with it. And I'll leave that, you know, for you to talk about. And uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. But this case was certainly national, international, yes. and it really, really was a precursor to what we saw later on as far as politics involved with uh, these types of high profile incidents. And a couple of years later, we know what happened, but this was different in my opinion. I think it was in yours. And so with that, I'll turn it over to you about uh, Stefan Clark. Sure. So um, in March of 2018, uh, Sacramento Police Department got, a, got you know, a 911 call coming in that somebody was breaking into windows, breaking into cars with a bat. And ultimately SAC PD responded and um, talked to a bunch of the neighbors. There was there's some very famous, probably, uh, helicopter video. The sheriff's helicopter was in the area at the time, and they captured Mr. Clark on their video, um, kind of running from one house, breaking breaking a slider of one house, jumping over a fence, and then ultimately the the law enforcement officers encountered him. And it wasn't obviously known at the time, but it ended up being his grandmother's backyard. And, you know, the whole thing unfolded essentially on, on the officer's body worn camera. Um, but, and, and sadly and tragically, Mr. Mr. Clark was shot and killed by law enforcement. And so just to kind of, so under, the listeners understand, you know, what, this is what most people don't even know. What is the role of the DA, right? What, when does the DA come in? What do they do? You know, the, the typical protocol in most counties is, you know, you have DA investigators that get called out. It's part of an MOU that you have with law enforcement. They respond out. In our county, they respond and they're kind of the observers at the scenes uh, for interviews and all that. The normal course of events is that, you know, the case gets investigated by law enforcement and then it's submitted to the DA's office for their legal review. Most people don't even understand what the job of the DA is. Our, our, our sole question on an officer involved shooting really is, was a crime committed? That's, that's really, it's not about civil liability. It's not about, you know, did they violate a, a 
use of force policy within the police department. We're not use of force. We don't evaluate the policies and the procedures of law enforcement. We evaluate the facts that come to us to decide was a crime committed. And so after many, many months of, of investigation, not just by the police agency, but by um, our crime lab did an extensive amount of crime lab work on various things uh, it, related to this. You know, and all the while, I think you know this, Mark, that within about 10 days or so of the shooting, it became a national story. It became within a week or so. And, you know, I'm, I'm not a new elected DA. I've been the elected DA now for about, I think I, I'm entering my third year. Um, but it's clearly the most high-profile officer involved shooting that I'd ever seen. Um, you know, we had hundreds of protesters at any given time. Um, within a fairly short period of time, it gets kind of into the weeds, but we had to put a fence around our building because our office um, was right along the street and there was an alley behind our building. And so, you know, we had employees that could not leave because of what was going on. It was extremely stressful for many people, uh, particularly the people from within our office. Imagine what it would be like for crime victims or witnesses trying to get to the DA's office and they're surrounded by protesters and a lot of people screaming. I mean, they were outside our building for upwards of a year, um, you know, doing different things. I, you know, myself personally, I got a lot of hate mail, got a lot of death threats. Uh, I started getting postcards from all over the country. Many of them seem to be from Portland, um, basically, you know, yelling at me in, in a written form to, to prosecute these killer cops. And, you know, for, for me, just like any other police officer or law enforcement member is, you know, our job is to follow the facts and law wherever it leads us. And so while it was very stressful, you know, and I had to, you know, we had to do a lot of things a lot differently in our office because of the security issues and all that. I never once wavered, my, my office never once wavered from our mission, which is follow the facts and the law, do your job, and, and, and be open and transparent about that process. What became, you know, pretty obvious pretty quickly is that even other elected officials had really no idea of what the job of the DA was. And so I think about 10 days or so, I could be wrong on my exact date, but I was asked by the city council of Sacramento, the mayor, can you come over to our city council? Can you do an explanation? Can you do a PowerPoint showing them what is the process like? And I was like, sure, of course I'll do that. And well, that didn't turn out well because the council meeting kind of lost control. And you may remember that Mr. Clark's brother, uh, showed up. A lot of other, a lot of people were there, and Mr. Clark's brother showed up and jumped up on the dais, and it just kind of lost control. Um, so, you know, as I told the mayor and others, you know, it wasn't the right time for me to do this presentation. So I did decide, you know, this is, it was all kind of like writing a playbook that had never been written, you know. So I decided to do a press conference fairly quickly to let the public understand what the process was. It, it was just a press conference to say, here's what the process is. So that at least they had some sense of what, um, what to expect. You know, and I think, you know, the hard part I think is, you know, the media might try to define the narrative and they might write the facts the way they believe them to be. And those facts may not be accurate. And so, for me, as the DA and my staff, my you know the other lawyers that were involved in it, investigators, you know that's oftentimes hard because you're gathering the facts all along the way, and maybe someone's not; those are not being portrayed correctly. Um, it seems to me that in the last few years, law enforcement's taken a much more proactive role in getting getting facts out sooner. I mean, body worn cameras are coming out quicker, all that stuff. Um, so that's kind of, you know, what happened for the year. It was extremely stressful. I'm not going to, I'm not going to shy away from that. I did learn a lot of things about how to lead through challenging times. And I tried to, you know, the most important thing for me, Mark, was treat everybody in this process with dignity and respect. Everyone, mm -hmm. Mr. Clark, 
his family, law enforcement, the community, um, because it was definitely something that was, you know, that, you know, this young man lost his life. There's no, that's a fact. Um, but my job, you know, in the, in the world of criminal justice, some of the stuff we look at is, it is, um, it's hard. It's hard things. Yeah. People, we see it on a regular basis, but that doesn't mean the public sees it or the families see it. And that sometimes, sometimes justice is not gentle, as somebody once said to me. And that can be very hard. So, um, you know, a, a little well, less. If I can, yeah, go ahead. I've been talking too long anyway. So, no, no, not at all. I just, because, no, 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 <laughs> no, I love it. I'm getting educated here, as I'm sure our listeners and viewers are. And um, again, I'm kind of riveted about this because you keep touching on, or a couple of times you touched on the word leadership right. and, and and the rule of law. And right. it just, this hits home with me because we, quite frankly, Anne-Marie, you and I both know, and I think, you know, so many people listening that we are witnessing a dearth of leadership adherence to the rule of law, courage, direction, stability. And these are the things that you exhibited. You know, I watched that press conference. I think it was hour plus. 90 minutes um, to be clear. 90 minutes. It yeah. I mean, it's been, no I haven't watched, yeah, I haven't watched it for a long time, right. but um, at the time I was an assistant chief. And so, you know, all of us in, you know, top management and these law enforcement agencies, we're watching this because, you know, there's so many ramifications that can come out of a case like this. Right. Um, so we were riveted. I know I was and, and watching this and, and all those other things are going on with the protest, you know, right. part of that. So I just I, you know, I want the audience to, to really have that sink in about really what grounding it took on your part and what courage it took on your part. I think uh, with these personal threats to do that. The other thing that you touched on was when you explained to the public, the media, what the role of the DA's office is, because I think what that does is, I mean, just in a in a strategic sense, it it kind of puts um, it puts things back on them. Listen, we're being transparent. Right. Here's what we have to do. Right. Here's what I'm sworn to do as the chief enforcement officer of Sacramento County. I have to abide by these rules. Correct. I think it's an absolutely great thing to do. We don't see enough of that. And um, so I think it was great. I think it was great four years ago. I think it's even better hearing it from you personally right now. It's a privilege to hear about this. But um, so I just wanted to chime in there. It's so important. I, I do want to talk about um, the, the, the process you went through to come to the decision you did, I think that's really going to be fascinating for people to, to break down the specific elements right. of what brought you and your team to the conclusion you did. Well, I mean, I think it's, you know, if you, if you watch the press conference or if you go back and, and reread our report, which was very, very lengthy, you know, we went meticulously through the facts and we presented, you know, I've never done a 90 minute press conference. I don't think I'll ever do another one like that again. I hope not. Um, mm -hmm. but, but the public and everybody else deserve to know the facts and, and the law as it applied. And, you know, some of the facts were hard to hear. For instance, you know, the contents of Mr. Clark's cell phone, which became, you know, important in our evaluation and people sometimes if I've said, you know, and I'm not saying this in particular about this case, but sometimes cell phones are like the windows to the mind because they, you know, they are very private details that, but they do reveal facts that can play a role in our evaluation. For instance, you know, in that particular case, there was a number of text messages that went back and forth. And I don't, I don't need to go into them because they're out there in the public domain if anybody wants to see them. But, but, you know, I even got criticized by some folks that you shouldn't have put all that information out there because it was, it, you know, it could be considered hurtful. And I get that. Um, but sadly, we have to evaluate cases in, that involve very intimate details of people's lives. And so the cell phone evidence became very relevant for us. Um, the video evidence, the body-worn camera, the officer's conduct. I mean, if you go back and we went meticulously through 
what the officers were saying on their body worn because spontaneous statements of the officers very much, in my view, clearly demonstrated they believe he had a gun. They believed Mr. Clark had a gun. Uh, sadly, he did not. But that doesn't change our eva- our evaluation is, it's that legal question. Did they have an honest and reasonable belief that they had to defend, defend themselves or defend others? And, and the conclusion was based upon all the facts and the evidence that, yes, they had that honest and, and reasonable belief. Um, and the video evidence all supported that. You know, the other evidence that we did, DNA stuff, we did paint analysis, glass analysis. There's a lot of work done on this case, rightfully so. Um, but it all ultimately, you know, there was other stuff that all came out about a prior incident of um, domestic violence that came out from a couple of days earlier. But ultimately, you know, I'm just kind of looking back through my PowerPoint, you know, the legal analysis, which is really the standard that we all follow was, is basically a police officer or anybody else is justified in using deadly force if you believe honestly and reasonably that there's an imminent threat uh, of death or great bodily injury. And that was, um, we looked at all the facts and circumstances, um, which, you know, we went through meticulously, not just in our review, but through that press conference. And the conclusion was that that was a justified shooting. Um, So it's, you know, at the end of it all, uh, it it was a tragic situation, and and that's the thing that I part of my what I would call my my hope of leadership that I learned, which is we have to dignify everybody, even if we make very hard decisions, and treat people with dignity and respect. And and it may not be the outcome that some folks want, but at least we did it with dignity and respect. It's kind of how I looked at that. Well, you certainly did. Um, you know, you certainly did watching that when I did four years ago, four and a half years ago now, I just can't believe how time flies. That's why I'm I know. would always say, but, but it, 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 it really has been a whirlwind. I mean, of course, so much has happened between then and now. Right. Um, but you know, we, we really saw, um, and you can comment on this, but as I said earlier, you know, subsequent to that case, I believe we saw the breakdown of the principles you're talking about in so many situations, so many other cases uh, in, in Baltimore and in Illinois. And um, I'm trying to think about some of these other cases well, that yeah. were, were yeah, there's so many where right. he's filed and later on, um, you know, the, the cases were thrown out uh, right. almost immediately because there was absolutely no evidence that, that law enforcement officers that committed a crime or, or for that matter, he even violated their own policies. Right. So, um, but I think those people succumb to political pressures or their own, their own agendas. Biases. Yeah. They're, they're all, their agendas. Their own agendas. Yes. Exactly. Which is, which is an absolute disrespect for the oath that they took. Um, they take the same or very similar oath that you took, that I took. Right. And we are, when you're putting personal agendas or, or succumbing to political pressure, you're no worse. I mean, you're no better, in my opinion, right. than the person you're prosecuting because you're, you're not adhering to the law. It makes me very angry. I get very passionate about that. And this is why I was so excited to have you on the show because you went through the ringer I and you exhibited what, what someone who believes in their oath of office actually does. That's why we take oaths because it's not always easy to do the job you're sworn to do. Uh, let me ask you this: What, what if any, during the whole process? Obviously, there were death threats and right. and all kinds of you know things you were dealing with. After your decision, after that press conference, did, did things uh, obviously ultimately did, but immediately did, did things calm down, did things get worse after a decision, what either from government officials or from the general public, how did things play out afterwards for you? Well, the night of the, so we did a press conference on a Saturday and that night actually somebody called. So I learned a lot about personal security through this process, but you know, I had kids, sure. I have kids, you know, I'm just like any other parent. I want to make sure that my family's safe and that nothing that I do in my profession impacts them. So, um, the night of the, of the press conference, somebody felt the urge to call nine one one and say they were going to drop 200 something thousand flyers 
over the city with my home address and go protest at my address. Um, you know, that's just, it was intimidation because they didn't have my address. Um, but you know, how does that, I mean, I had to have investigators basically sleep outside my house for a couple of weeks. I had to, I had to establish a security detail that, you know, I had people show up at restaurants. I went and spoke at a, I remember speaking at a, um, a women's lunch, women lawyers luncheon and protesters showed up at the luncheon and, and, you know, they actually bought tickets so they could get up and do their thing at the, at the luncheon. They, I've had, I've spoken, I mean, even as, as recently as this last summer, I guess, maybe, maybe earlier in the spring, you know, I'll go speak at a, a public function and people show up and start screaming at me. And, you know, it's, I don't stand in the shoes of people that have lost loved ones like this. And I, and I, I try to do everything I can to empathize, but screaming at me, um, all that kind of stuff is not moving us forward. Um, so yeah, it, I, I would say that that caused a lot of stress, not just during that period of time, it changed the way that I, you know, hold myself out there publicly because, you know, good, bad, or indifferent people were very angry. Some people were angry about the decision. Um, so yeah, it's calm. I would say it's calmed down. I don't think the pain has gone away for his family, clearly, and I understand that. Um, but the facts are the facts, and I and we're not going to rewrite history. That, that that this is what happened that night. Sadly, um, are is a set of facts that are never going to change. Okay, it's not going to. You know, you can. I I say this sometimes, somewhat probably sarcastically, is you can yell at me all you want. It's not going to change how I do my job. You yelling, somebody yelling louder is not going to change. I mean, I, I say this to some extent, again, sarcastically, is, you know, they, somebody, a protester, put a pinata of my head outside my building, okay, and had a child beat it up with a bat. And I was like, you know, imagine, I mean, just like, really? Is that how we teach nonviolence is with violence? Um, so it was, that was, I mean, I have seen a lot. I had to learn a lot about my own personal safety and the safety of my employees and, you know, the core group of people that were involved in this, um, making sure that we protected our, ourselves as well. Um, so it's sad. I mean, there's clearly, you know, a lot of anger. And when I went to that, honestly, though, Mark, when I went to the city council meeting that kind of went off the rails, what I what I really felt like was there was a lot of rage and a lot of anger. And it's not all related to this particular shooting. It's related to bigger issues like poverty, right? economic disparity, mm -hmm. housing. And, and all of those are important things that we can't ignore. Um, so there, it's just like we got a lot of problems in this world. And we better start working on fixing them instead of dividing us more. Right. I couldn't agree more. And, you know, I sit there and listen to you, Anne-Marie, uh, about really, I mean, your, your comprehensive view of not just obviously this particular situation, but, but everything around it in the big picture. And I don't know how anybody uh, can listen to you on this podcast or, uh, or listen to you four and a half years ago. Uh, well, actually it wasn't four and a half years ago with the, uh, um, press conference, but listen to you for actually about four years ago now and, and come to the conclusion that you are not objective, that you're not fair, that you don't see the big picture and you don't do the right thing for the right reasons. And again, it's, it's remarkable. Unfortunately, your behavior is now remarkable because it's, it's in the minority of behavior, in my opinion, I know across this country and, you know, we're, we're running out of uh, leaders like you. Well, I, appreciate um, that. I hope that we're going to, I hope we're going to turn that curve. I hope we're going to, that, that corner, I hope we're going to have a rebound and people like you can be examples and can blaze the trail, can actually bring some courage to other people. So, you know what, if this fantastic woman can do the right <laughs> thing, then yeah. damn it, maybe I can do it. And again, I don't mean to, I won't, I'm not, you know, blowing smoke. It takes a lot of courage to do what you did and how you did it. 
and we don't see enough of it. And I mean that we do not see enough of it. And this is why the tenets of your legal nature are so important. The rule of law, a civil society, right. that parent, that parent, that monster who had a pinata, a pinata of your head made and let their child beat it. Right. That is a monster to me. This is a person that is contributing to the problem of chaos. This is child abuse. If they teach their child that it's okay to do this right. in effigy, this is wrong in, in self-responsibility. They're not teaching self-responsibility. These things that I talk about on, on your Leo Nation are not just words. Any more than the oath you took is just are just words. Right. They mean something. So I get very passionate about it. And that's why I feel so fortunate. Again, I said it many times to have you on the show. It, it really the hope that people out there, other people in, in leadership positions will actually demonstrate leadership, not just go to work every well, day with the title. On the I've desk. tried. I want to, yeah, I mean, I've tried to, you know, good, better, and different. I learned a lot from that particular case. But it's not just about you know, how to do your job with following the facts and law. It's also, how do you lead through these challenging times? And, mm -hmm. you know, I remember right. along the way, I was writing notes to myself saying, I don't want to forget this moment because this is kind of my own teaching moment. So, you know, like one of the things we did, you know, keep in mind that the public's upset, but I also lead an organization of, you know, 400 employees and they're, they have anxiety because they don't know when are you going to make a decision are you going to consider our, our needs as, as employees? And I, I distinctly recall one day, you know, probably eight months after all of these protests that continued that I said to my, my chief deputy, and I said, Hey, maybe we should just buy people some pizza today. We bought, we just thought threw it out there, had no idea if people were going to show up and almost the whole office showed up and we let them ask questions because they just had questions. Some of them, we couldn't answer. Like they wanted to know what day are you going to release your decision? I can't tell you that. And we kept it very much to ourselves because we wanted to make sure people were going to be safe. But what we did tell them, which is kind of what they just needed to know was your safety and the safety of this community is the, is the most important thing that we're going to consider. And you, you can, you can appreciate and you can understand that we're going to consider that in our decision on when to release this decision. So that I think just putting them at ease, but you know, so transparent, as I call it, transparency with your, your own office, your, who you lead, transparency with the public. You know, I think that goes a long way. You might show up and say, you know what? I can't answer that question, but at least you show up. It's kind of how I looked at it. Yeah. I think, I think that bode well um, for folks, I hope. Well, I'm sure it did. People can learn a lot from you. And uh, speaking of other people, you know, learning a lot from you, as I have just in the last, you know, 45 minutes or so, um, your your term is up in, in January of, of 23. Right. Eight years. Yeah. And we talked earlier just briefly that you said you're still going to be involved in some some capacity. Uh, if you can talk about it, it's not confidential. What what are your plans? And, and I'm hoping, I'm hoping those plans include include mentoring people in decision-making uh, positions. I'm just hoping. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, I mean, first of all, I'm going to stay in the world. I'm not ready to stop working. I have a young son and just starting high school. I, I enjoy this work. I, you know, I'm not going to act as a prosecutor. I kind of, as I said to somebody, I don't want to be involved in the sausage making of the bills of the legislature mm -hmm. because it's it, honestly, it gets depressing um, but what my plan is, is, you know, whether you call it consulting or advising, my plan is to stay in the world of public safety, but in the private capacity of advising mm -hmm. um, on the areas that I love. I can't say really what they are, but I'm still working. I mean, I, I've got plans, but um, stay tuned for that. But 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 I do intend to stay involved in kind of the same stuff you're doing, Mark, which is this important movement where we're seeing that we're eroding our the fabric of our community and so i would i want to be involved listen i i was involved in jackie Lacey's race she's a dear friend um it was i mean i i did everything i could to you know myself with others to try to you know keep her in office 
And now we see the consequences that is unfolding in LA. And oh, so, boy, yeah. boy, do we? Oh, for yeah. sure. And I, Ugh. I mean, I'll do everything I can to make sure that a real DA actually gets elected down there and not somebody that wants to destroy the system as we know is happening oh, right now. Please. Right. That's a whole nother podcast. Oh, yeah. So I, I intend to stay actively involved in public safety and, and, and be passionate about what I believe in, which is kind of like you, the rule of law and um, promoting good policies and good practices. So excited it's about it. wonderful to excited hear. Excited about it. Well, good. I, I can hear the excitement. I can hear the sincerity in your voice. And uh, you and I are definitely on the same page. Uh, and by the way, I, I am so grateful that our mutual friend, Joy Esposito, made the introduction. Me too. And um, it's it's uh, wonderful. I, I'm telling you right now, Amory, I'm looking forward to to the opportunity to work with you mm -hmm. in, in those endeavors. And whatever way that you know we can make things happen, um, people like you uh, are needed to step up. Yeah. And uh, it just takes a few. So whatever we can do together. However, I can support you. I'm looking forward to it. And we are going to save our country. We are going to honor and save the rule of law. And we are going to go ahead and reinforce how important uh, self-responsibility is. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you have had the pleasure, <laughs> as have I, of speaking with Anne-Marie Schubert. And I think I had been tipsy when I came on the air earlier. So forgive me for that. So, uh, Well, thanks for uh, having me. I really to, appreciate just, it very much, it, Mark. It's been it's been so much fun. I'm sure we're going to talk again. Thank you so much. Don't leave Anne Marie. I Hang will. on there one second. Everybody, like I guys always say, reach out. Click on the button here, right above me here. Yourleonation.org. Uh, tell all your friends about it, and click on the bu the donate button that goes to our nonprofit, uh, the Leo Project, and uh, tax deductible. We're going to work on uh, supporting families of fallen uh, law enforcement officers. God bless you, Anne-Marie. God bless everybody listening. You hang in there. And don't forget, always stick by the rule of law. It's the only way to go. God bless everybody. Thank you.